Meropenem and vancomycin are not going to work with this one. Legionnaires is one of the most severe forms of community-acquired pneumonia, and it's one of the major reasons why the treatment guidelines for pneumonia are structured the way they are. I'll explain that in a minute. But first, why is it called Legionnaire's disease in the first place? Well, it got its name after a major outbreak in a hotel at the American Legion Convention in 1976. The bacterium that causes it is called Legionella pneumophila. And this is a bacterium that thrives in lukewarm water. Not too hot, not too cold, just a little warm. That's ideal. And that is why it often causes outbreaks in hotels and other facilities that use centralized air conditioning like spa resorts and even hospitals. Anywhere where there is an air conditioning system or water supply that includes reservoirs of stagnant, lukewarm water. That is how it spreads. And this is why it's so important to keep the temperature of water in such systems in check. Legionella is quickly killed if the temperature rises above 60 degrees Celsius, but it thrives at lower temperatures. You will see that, due to this fact, Air conditioning systems are mentioned a lot in the literature on legionnaires. So, air conditioning, air conditioning, beware of your air conditioning. But I have to emphasize once again that this applies to big centralized systems that include reservoirs and circulation of lukewarm water. The AC in your car or your apartment is not going to kill you. That is not how it works. There needs to be lukewarm water and lots of it. Okay, now that we know how it spreads, what exactly does it do? Well, Legionnaire's disease is first and foremost a form of pneumonia, and it's usually severe enough to warrant hospitalization and sometimes even ICU admission. In other words, your patients with Legionnaire's will not be walking around with a slight cough. They will be seriously ill. And from a clinical standpoint, Legionnaire's is quite similar to other types of bacterial pneumonia. That said, there are some telltale signs that should lead you to suspect possible legionnaires. Number one, general symptoms usually precede respiratory symptoms. So, the patient suddenly gets rigors, chills, very high fever, but only after a day or two do they start to cough. This is typical. Of course, this poses a diagnostic difficulty if the patient seeks medical attention right away. You just see a febrile patient who might even look septic, but you have no idea what is wrong with them, what is the source of this sepsis. Even a chest x-ray will typically be normal in the first day or two. The reason why this is so important is because if you decide to start empirical antibiotics for suspected sepsis, the antibiotics you choose will probably not cover legionnaires, right? You remember how I said in the beginning that meropenem and vancomycin are not going to cover this bug, because you are not expecting it. This early, you don't even know that your patient has pneumonia, let alone legionnaires, right? But after a day or two, once the dry cough sets in and an infiltrate appears on x-ray, you will know. So, the fact that respiratory symptoms and x-ray changes lag behind fever is a telltale sign number one. Number two, the cough is usually unproductive, dry, and it's not accompanied by coryza or other upper respiratory tract symptoms. And this sets legionnaires apart from your garden variety bacterial pneumonia that often happens as a complication of influenza or another viral respiratory illness. Legionnaires start right out of the blue, with no preceding viral illness. This is typical. Number three. In the labs, you will often find a discrepancy between very high CRP and only mildly elevated leukocytes. Actually, the highest CRP I've seen personally was in a patient with Legionnaires, 597. But his leukocytes were almost normal. In addition to that, unexpectedly low sodium is also a common finding in severe Legionnaires. Of course, none of these findings are specific for legionnaires. They can be found in other diseases, right? But in medicine, we always look at multiple elements and try to form a bigger picture. So, if you see a patient in their late 20s or older who has moderately severe or severe pneumonia that started abruptly with general symptoms and then respiratory symptoms appeared later and then you see very high CRP with almost normal leukocytes and perhaps low sodium, Legionnaires will be at the very top of your list of possibilities. Ask your patient if they know anyone else who got sick. Remember, legionnaires can happen in outbreaks. But 
truth to be told, most of the time, people will not be able to remember where they might have gotten infected. So most of the time, you will not know where this disease came from. Okay, so how do you confirm that it's Legionnaires? Well, in severely ill patients who are intubated or sick enough to require bronchoscopy, you can take a respiratory sample and send it for PCR. This is the most sensitive and specific method. But more commonly, a urine sample antigen test will be employed. Its specificity is excellent. So if your patient has pneumonia and this test comes back positive, your patient definitely has Legionnaires. But its sensitivity, on the other hand, is not perfect. It's around 80%. In other words, a negative test does make Legionnaires less likely, but it doesn't exclude it with 100% certainty. All in all, the test is not perfect, but for the most part, it's good enough. It's cheap, widely available, and it can be done in minutes. So no wonder we use it all the time in practice for Legionnaires. Okay. Finally, how do we treat Legionnaires? Well, Legionella hides within cells, which means it's protected from most antibiotics, including all beta-lactams, even meropenem, right? So beta-lactams like penicillins, cephalosporins, and even carbapenems will not work at all. You will need antibiotics that achieve high concentrations within cells, within lung tissue and inflammatory cells. For this, it's best to use macrolides like azithromycin or fluoroquinolones like levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. And now we come to the question of guidelines for community-acquired pneumonia. You will see that for pneumonia that is severe enough to warrant hospitalization, most guidelines will recommend a beta-lactam antibiotic like amoxicillin and clavulanate or ceftriaxin plus a macrolide like azithromycin. Or if your patient cannot receive this combination, monotherapy with levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. There are several reasons for that and I explained them in detail in my course on antibiotics, but the major reason is Legionnaires. It's definitely not the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia, but it's common enough and certainly severe enough to warrant empirical coverage. That is why you find azithromycin or quinolones and not just beta-lactams in all the guidelines for moderately severe or severe community-acquired pneumonia. As you can see, I only focus on things that help you make better clinical decisions in practice. And while I do my best to cram as much useful information as possible into these videos, this is nothing compared to my longer, structured courses where you truly master the logic of antibiotics and you can come up with the conclusions I'm presented in this video on your own because you understand what you are doing. The link to the free demo version of this course with the first few crucial lessons is in the description. If you use antibiotics on a regular basis, this will be a game changer. Antibiotics are life-saving drugs after all, and if you are a clinician, I'm confident you will realize right away how essential this knowledge is, and why the approach I explain in the course works so well in practice. If you want to master all you need in practice, but you don't have time to spend months studying on your own, this is the course for you. Already after an hour, you will understand what I'm talking about. Take care.